This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled Pediatric BMT, Optimizing Outcomes After Transplant for Aplastic Anemia and MDS. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lee Clark, and I'll be moderating the presentation. As we get started, I would like to thank the generous support of Be The Match, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, our patients, families, and caregivers for providing support for this educational program today. As we get um, as we get started, I'd also like to um, speak on behalf of Be The Match, uh, who was um, in partnership with us today for the webinar. Be The Match um, offers a support center which helps patients, families from diagnosis through survivorship. They offer confidential one-on-one -on -one support, access to financial resources, and free educational materials. All of their programs and resources are free. A few of their programs include telephone counseling with a licensed social worker, connections with other uh, patients and parents who have been through the transplant process, helping and finding and about joining clinical trials. To learn more about Be The Match or to get connected with their organization for support, you can email patientinfo at n m d p dot org or you can call eight 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 nine 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 six seven four three or visit their website which is be the match dot org slash patient I'd also like to share some educational opportunities here at the foundation that you may have interest. We are we host national conferences throughout the US our conferences are designed to make more information on bone marrow failure disease more accessible to patients and families. Our last conference for 2019 will actually be next Saturday in Jacksonville, Florida, which is November the 16th. Registration is open, and you can read, see more about the conference at aamds.org slash conferences. This month, we have one webinar left in our 2019 series. That webinar will be regarding biosimilars impact for patients and will occur on Wednesday, November the 13th. For more information about this webinar or to view our past webinars, please visit aamds.org slash learn. This webinar will be archived to the webinar portal within four to seven business days. You will be notified by email when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation by using the text chat window on the lower right-hand side of your screen. To submit a question or a comment, please type in this small text box just below the text chat window. When you have finished typing, just hit enter. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions today. When submitting questions, we do ask that you provide the minimal amount of personal information you feel is necessary to respond to your question. Our speaker cannot answer any specific questions privy to your personal health care. You will not be able to communicate with others during this session via the chat window. Only the moderators will be able to see what is being asked. If you would like to connect with others, we do offer a peer support network, which is a national network of volunteers, which includes patients, caregivers, and family members who are willing to listen and offer support. We also host community connection support groups across the U.S. If you're interested in connecting with a peer support network volunteer or finding a support group in your area, please give us a call at 800 747-2820 or send us an email at help 
H E L P at A A M D S dot org. Immediately following this webinar, a post event survey will pop up on the screen. Please take a few minutes to complete this brief survey. Your responses do help us improve our future webinars and make sure that we're meeting your needs. Today's presenter is Dr. Michael Pulsifer. He joined the Children's Center for Blood and uh, sorry for Cancer and Blood Diseases as the head of the section of the uh, Blood and Marrow Transplant Program um, at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. He is also currently the group chair of the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Consortium, which is an 80-member international clinical trials group and is recognized as a leading influence in the field of pediatric uh, BMT. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pulsiver. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. It's always a privilege to be able to work with the uh, Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation on these presentations. Um, I really love uh, uh, speaking with patient groups and, and uh, answering some of your questions about uh, these very critical and important questions. So our goal today um, is to really carefully decide when to transplant and how to do it, and then what I want to do is guide you through um, a number of things that you could potentially do along the way. So that's going to be broken down uh, into a section at the beginning about right diagnosis at the right time. Uh, sometimes it's confusing when you have marrow failure to know exactly what it is, and it's critical to know what you're doing from the very beginning uh, because it makes a lot of difference uh, about deciding if and when to have a transplant. Um, what we'll then talk about is approaches. There are a number of different diseases, aplastic anemia, different types of inherited marrow failure syndrome, uh, and of course MDS. Each one of those diseases, even though they look the same at the beginning, um, their uh, uh, eventual approach is very different. Um, so we need to treat the, them differently uh, as far as how they're transplanted, and we time transplantation differently. What we'll then talk about is before and during the BMT. What can you do um, uh, uh, in order to really help, in order to maximize the chance uh, that uh, you or your child will have a better outcome? And then finally, after you have your BMT, are the things you can do to maximize your health? Um, what, are, what should you do about follow-up long-term? Are there late effects you should screen for? And how can you make sure that you have a healthy life um, uh, as you move forward? So let's talk a little bit about what this is all about, marrow failure. This slide on the left shows you a healthy marrow. Um, what you see are a lot of cells, those dark purple um, circles that you see um, uh, surrounded by light purple, um, those are normal, healthy bone marrow cells. And if you look closely, you see that there's a wide variety of types of cells in that bone marrow. This is what you're supposed to be seeing in a healthy bone marrow. Now, the challenge is that on the right, uh, what you're seeing is marrow failure, um, uh, an aplastic bone marrow. Um, on the left, you see the big fat droplets. On the right, all that you see is fat droplets um, and almost no cells at all. Um, this is what uh, we see so often. Now, looking at that um, uh, uh, acellular marrow where you don't see any cells, um, uh, it can be a couple of different things. It can be aplastic anemia. It can be early leukemia. It can be bone marrow failure from an inherited uh, situation. And rarely you can even have an MDS that looks like this, where it's called hypoplastic MDS. More often with MDS, you're going to see more cells, and they're just not working very well. But hypoplastic MDS also can just look like that picture you see on the right. Now, um, your first step is going to be to rule out MDS or inherited marrow failure syndrome. If you rule out those and there's no other explanation, then you have acquired aplastic anemia. And so that's the key, again, is to try to, to uh, rule those things out uh, to begin with. So how do you rule out MDS? Um, now, one of the important things to keep uh, in mind about MDS 
um, is that uh, it is critical to know that you have MDS early on um, uh, it, it, because the treatment is very, very different. Um, you rule that out by doing specific tests. Cytogenetic or FISH testing looks at the chromosomes associated with MDS. MDS is almost invariably a disease that um, is associated with chromosomal changes. Every once in a while you don't get what you need. Cytogenetic tests is just looking at the chromosome. FISH are when you use a, a kind of a glow-in-the-dark antibody that allows you to tell when there have been changes in the genes. Sometimes that's not good enough. You have to do even more accurate testing to, to figure it out. Um, the appearance of the bone marrow will also give you some clues. Um, but it's very important as you're undergoing your initial diagnosis to really talk to your doctors about making sure that they're confident that you don't have uh, MDS. Now, let's talk a little bit about inherited bone marrow failure syndrome. These are genetic disorders um, that result um, in either the whole bone marrow not working well or one part of it. And there are three major parts in your bone marrow function. There's platelets, there's red cell production, Platelets help you clot, red cell production, take ox takes oxygen um, uh, to your tissues. The final part is white cells, which are part of your immune system. Um, and so you can have either one of those cells down or all three of them. Many of these bone marrow failure syndromes are associated with phenotypic abnormalities. Now that fancy word just means that you have findings like your thumbs aren't quite right or maybe your face looks a little bit different or maybe there are some other things that give you a hint that um, uh, you have a genetic illness. Um, in it, all of these inherited bone marrow failure syndromes have a propensity to develop MDS as well. So you can have both uh, hereditary bone marrow failure syndrome and MDS at the same time. Now, if you don't have any of those, um, uh, that's when we call you acquired aplastic anemia. And um, there's two types of aplastic anemia. The first, of course, uh, is um, what we call non-severe aplastic anemia, where your accounts aren't quite as low. And then there's severe aplastic anemia. Severe aplastic anemia is when your ANC is less than 500, platelets are less than 20, your red cells are very low and you need blood transfusion with a low reticulocyte count. Um, if you have two out of three of those, then you have severe aplastic anemia and you definitely need treatment. If you have less severe aplastic anemia, sometimes we watch that. Um, now moving on, um, what I wanna talk a little bit about is how can we be sure that there's not inherited marrow failure syndromes? This is a long list of a wide variety of syndromes um, that you may hear about if you have a child who goes uh, uh, in with marrow failure. Um, the most common of these, Fanconi anemia, is something that almost all uh, pediatric uh, patients have testing for uh, very early on. The reason why that's so important is Fanconi anemia really is dramatically different and almost anything you do has to be treated slightly differently. But these other two diseases, Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome, dyskeratosis congenita, they also um, uh, 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 you know, change everything, change the way you get your bone marrow transplant, et cetera. So we want to know uh, about those uh, as well. So how can you get a hint that you're that your child may have a bone marrow failure syndrome um, rather than uh, regular aplastic anemia? Well, sometimes, again, looking at your child, you can tell. Now, these are really dramatic uh, differences. You see this picture here. This is of uh, an abnormal hand. Um, what we call radial anomalies or changes in the hand um, are a sign of Fanconi anemia, abnormal or missing thumbs, um, your radius is one of the bones in your wrist. Um, so if those are missing, it's very likely that you're going to have, your child is going to have Fanconi anemia. There are other things you can see on the body too. See this little spot here? Um, this is what's called a cafe au lait spot. Um, you see here uh, another picture of an abnormal thumb. All of those can be associated with different types of marrow failure, but most often with Fanconi anemia. Your chest can have a slight 
changes that's associated with Schwarzman diamond. And you can see a wide variety of other things here. You can see eye changes, ear changes, changes in the nails, and um, uh, also the tongue that are associated with dyscarosis congenita. Developmental delay in some of the more rare situations. Very rare neurologic findings. These are findings associated with the penis, with hypospadias, and cryptorchidism with the testicles. Um, bottom line is, your physicians should be doing very careful physical examinations to make sure that there aren't any findings they give them a hint that maybe this is more than a plastic anemia, maybe this is an inherited marrow failure syndrome. There are things you can't see. On occasion, patients can have kidney changes, changes in the heart, changes in the lung, elevated liver function tests, um, uh, a fatty pancreas, and thin bones, sometimes lots of uh, problems with teeth. Now, um, many times, you don't need to test for all of these things if, you're, if your child looks like a very straightforward aplastic anemia. But don't be surprised if, as part of your workup, you look carefully and see if some of these changes occur. This is a picture of what's called a horseshoe kidney. This is actually one kidney that stretches um, all the way around. Now, um, one of the things that we have learned over time is that when we're worried about the potential of an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome, we really need to do genetic screening. And sometimes this is a, a frustrating uh, a challenge for patients because it takes a long time for uh, people to be firm about their diagnosis. We know that the child has marrow failure syndrome, but we're not 100% sure exactly what type of marrow failure syndrome it is. So we have to look carefully. I wanted to just show you a study where um, uh, a group of patients had this uh, done and intensive assessment was done in order to figure it out. So essentially, this didn't include um, patients who already showed up and they were pretty sure uh, uh, of what they had. In other words, if you showed up and you had the abnormal fingers or thumbs um, and, and people thought you had Fanconi anemia, they didn't include those, uh, those patients. Um, uh, aplastic anemia patients, those weren't included because they, people felt very confident. Um, uh, this is a study of a number of patients where they fell in the category where they were not really sure. In other words, they had um, cytopenias or low blood counts of one, two, or three lines, and they weren't sure what they had, but they maybe had some physical abnormalities, or maybe there was a family history, or they were very, very young. Um, so what they decided to do is screen those patients uh, by doing a whole exome sequencing. That's looking at every bit of your DNA. They also took skin fibroblasts to be extra sure um, uh, whether or not uh, these patients had something uh, that was um, in their genes. <clears throat> now, this picture is a little bit of a confusing picture, but just to try to explain it to you, um, what it is uh, is just an indication of the types um, uh, of uh, diseases that were noted. Um, so the first thing is some of these patients had immune deficiencies, um, rarely. Those immune deficiencies can cause um, uh, immune changes that can knock their counts down. Some of these patients had some of the four disorders that are associated um, with low platelets that then went on to cause bone marrow failure. Some of these patients had, a, uh, in a broad category, um, a, a diagnosis of congenital neutropenia um, uh, that then also went on to have more marrow failure. Others had diamond black fan anemia, others Fanconi anemia, others dyskeratosis congenita. Now, in the middle of all this, there were new diseases and other uh, diseases that came up, uh, something called SAMD9 and SAMD9 uh, ligand deficiency. There were other rare genetic abnormalities as well, LIG4, um, ERK C6L2, GATA2, MECON, and ATR. All of these are rare disorders, very rare disorders, that are sometimes passed in families. So it was very useful for, this, uh, uh, for these people to know what was going on. Now, unfortunately, only half of the patients where we did detailed studies 
uh, we were able to find a diagnosis in, or this group uh, that, that did this was able to find a diagnosis in. So you don't find a genetic cause all the time, but if there's a worry and a concern about genetic causes, um, and you can't figure it out in the beginning, it may be worth doing a whole exome sequence, or at least talking to your doctors about looking in detail up at the genes uh, to see if there's anything that they can find. So, now, let's assume that you figured out what you have. You have either MDS, an inherited marrow syndrome, or a plastic anemia. Now, the approaches are a little bit different. Um, in MDS, in general, for children, almost always, we're going to do bone marrow transplant, and we're going to do it relatively soon with an intense regimen, and I'll talk in more detail about that. For an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome, most of the time, we're going to wait until marrow failure occurs completely. So if you show up and you have signs of an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome, you don't have that marrow failure yet, we're going to wait a little bit while, uh, a little bit of time. Um, and, you know, don't let it go too far along, uh, but catch patients when uh, just before their marrow failure gets severe. Um, it's important to know exactly what you have uh, because the transplant approaches are different. With a plastic anemia, though, uh, we're going to do either immune suppression or BMT with a reduced intensity regimen, so a very different BMT approach, a much safer BMT approach. Now, the next thing to talk about is just a few more details about MDS patients. For children and young adults, there's no doubt that transplantation is the preferred first therapy. When you talk about MDS in um, much older patients, many uh, individuals um, understanding that transplant can be very risky can get temporary therapies that will maybe make them feel a little bit better and decrease their transplant burden. Those therapies, though, are not curative. In children who have a big, long life to live, um, our, our approach is to give them curative therapy because we know if we wait too long, advanced MDS has a poor outcome with transplantation, um, and uh, so we'd really like to, uh, to transplant a little bit earlier. This slide here um, uh, is, is interesting. It is all patients who are transplanted, and essentially what, what is shown in this slide uh, from the uh, CIBMTR um, is almost all patients who are older. Um, uh, the average age of MDS is in the, in the, in the 70s. Um, many patients who undergo transplant are between age 50 and 75, um, and so this is their outcomes. Unfortunately, only about a 50-50 chance of being cured with transplant. With children, it's a lot better. Um, it, this graph is really inaccurate. Um, it, it's not too different from advanced MDS. So if you have a, a child who shows up and they have a lot of blasts um, uh, and, and they have what's called advanced MDS, then maybe they're only going to have a 40% chance or so uh, of cure with transplant. Uh, but early um, uh, transplantation uh, and uh, transplantation in earlier stages, something we call refractory anemia, invariably leads to a better outcome in children where cure rates are much higher in the 70 to 80 percent uh, range. Now, how about preparative approaches? This is a study um, presented on the left. These survival curves show um, uh, uh, how patients do with transplantation using myeloablative approaches um, or more intense therapies versus non-myeloablative or reduced intensity regimens. Now, this um, particular study had both AML and um, MDS, uh, and um, but uh, but what it showed is a very clear difference: um, a much improved uh, survival when patients were treated with more intense regimens. Fort and uh, this here, this is a relapse rate, uh, and most of the time when pe patients failed, it was because they relapsed. This is the pediatric rate of less than 20%, excuse me, this is the, the um, uh, rate of relapse with uh, uh, patients who are receiving more intense therapies uh, in the less than 20% range. Children can tolerate more intense therapies much better, so almost invariably we recommend more intense therapies uh, or myeloablative approaches in order to treat MDS uh, in children. Now, one important thing to point out, um, people have studied lots of different approaches, 
And what we have shown uh, is that radiation doesn't necessarily help in patients transplanted um, uh, uh, with MDS. In other words, you can use a chemotherapy-based um, approach. So busulfan or a newer medicine that hasn't yet been approved in the U.S., but hopefully will be soon, triosulfan, once it's approved, we may see um, uh, more transplantation with that. But these regimens, um, which hopefully lead to less long-term side effects, are usually the, pre compared to radiation uh, re regimens, those are usually the preferred uh, approaches with our more intensive approaches to pediatrics. Now let's talk about inherited bone marrow failure syndrome. When should you transplant those patients? That's uh, uh, difficult to say, but as I mentioned, waiting for MDS or AML is usually the best thing. Um, the other thing, and this is even more important, you have to be very confident that your physicians really are experts in that particular area. Um, uh, if you have a center that's a very large pediatric center and has a lot of experience, um, then it's highly likely you're going to get the very best advice. If you have a very small center, they may have amazing um, expertise in inherited bone marrow failure syndromes, but they may not. These are very rare diseases. Um, so it's very reasonable to talk to your physicians about um, their expertise. And if, if, um, they, if your local physicians don't have deep expertise, um, in inherited marrow failure syndromes, then it's okay to um, go uh, uh, and get that uh, at centers that do have a lot of experience um, uh, with these, because there are some centers that specialize uh, in these very particular disorders because of an interest of some of the physicians there. Now, let's talk a tiny bit about approaches. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just a couple of general principles. Fanconi anemia, requires minimal preparative regimen. This is a disorder where the uh, chromosomes are very fragile and they fall apart with chemotherapy or radiation. They need very minimal preparative regimens. Um, they need BMT very early, hopefully before the marrow failure gets severe. Um, there's a debate about how much radiation to use uh, in these patients, which you can uh, talk to your physicians about in great detail. But you must know uh, whether or not your patient has Fanconi anemia in detail so that you can uh, really target it specifically for that disease. Dyskeratosis congenita. This disorder is associated with problems with the lung and liver that get worse over time, and that problem is something called fibrosis. Um, the lung and liver, uh, if you're not careful, can have exacerbation of the disease by an intense approach. So all agree that a reduced intensity approach to transplantation is needed. There are approaches now to, to minimize it uh, and do what we call an alkylator-free approach. Um, that hopefully will help dyskeratosis congenita patients uh, to do well long-term after transplant. But this is a very tricky um, disease to transplant for. Diamond black fan anemia, they usually can tolerate a full prep. Um, Schwachmann diamond, it's generally better to do a less intense prep. Um, now, a final thing just to say, bone marrow transplant usually is only going to cure the marrow component of the disease. There may be other aspects of the disease that continue. Um, and so it's important to understand this uh, when you go in to get your transplant procedure. Um, there may be other parts of the disease that the bone marrow transplant won't cure. So let's talk now uh, about aplastic anemia. So what's the traditional approach to aplastic anemia? Um, uh, the traditional approach is um, uh, to have a match sibling transplant if that is available, uh, or immune suppression therapy if it's not. Um, what then uh, happens is an unrelated donor if patients fail, um, or second immune suppression or HAPLO if there are no unrelated donors. Now that's the tradition, um, but I'm going to show you some compelling reasons to think that we're doing a little bit better now and maybe we ought to consider um, a couple of things. Um, I'm going to talk about upfront unrelated donor transplantation, which I don't recommend unless you go on a study, and I'll explain why. 
I'm going to talk about better outcomes with haploidentical transplantation that should make you consider doing that type of transplant um, if you have failed immune suppression without getting a second course of uh, immune suppression. And I'm going to talk about the potential effect of l added to upfront therapy, how that um, uh, may potentially help, but we don't have enough long-term data to know for sure. So this um, particular slide is a very useful slide. Um, this is, again, of the traditional approach. And uh, what this shows is if you are less than 40 to 50, really the preferred treatment is HLA identical siblings. So for sure in pediatrics, if you're lucky enough to have a sibling who's an HLA match, a bone marrow match, that has great outcomes. Um, in, in my experience, 100%, um, the literature reflects 95% to, to uh, overall survival. Um, uh, it's, it's really the preferred therapy. Um, ATG plus cyclosporin is given then if you don't have a, an, uh, a, a sibling. The type of ATG that you get matters. Horse ATG really matters. Um, and uh, what you then do is assess for response. Usually at four months, if you have a complete uh, or a good response and you're no longer needing transfusions um, uh, and your ANC is up, um, then um, uh, continuing on um, immune suppression and hopefully weaning off eventually is the approach. But if you haven't had a response, uh, then uh, basically um, unrelated donors um, with a potential thought about a second um, uh, 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 treatment with ADG or other therapies. Now, this doesn't talk about ultramble pack. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Now, again, this is the outcomes. Um, one of the things that's important to understand um, uh, with this is the dilemma that you're faced uh, with immune suppression therapy with sibling uh, transplant. If you look at the survival curve for patients who get immune suppression therapy alone, what you will see is it'll be very similar to this. In other words, the survival rate is about the same. And that's because you can keep patients alive for a long time if you start them with immune suppression therapy. This is some of the latest data published by the North American Pediatric Apoxygenemia Consortium just recently um, in the Hematologica Journal. And so this has really uh, most up-to-date uh, outcomes. Now, it doesn't include l thrombopag, but what you see is a very high response rate. Um, in this, a complete remission occurred in more than half the patients, a complete plus a very good partial remission occurred in about 67% of these patients, and um, others had a partial response. Um, but even with that great response that you see in pediatrics, you see a big fall off in the first couple of years because a lot of patients um, don't have a, a full response and they eventually need to go on to transplant or other therapies. And you see this keeps falling off. Now this is out so far that it, it's not really accurate anymore. But bottom line is about half the patients um, uh, really can be treated adequately but if you're treated with immune suppression, eventually you're going to need another therapy. Um, when patients got to the point where they fall off this curve, they basically are getting another therapy. Um, with, with matched sibling transplantation, though, they're, they're long-term cured. Now, this is unrelated donor transplantation. This is with all comers and a number of patients who are super sick and have an, a, an infection and who don't have time to wait for um, ATG and cyclosporin to work. Um, sometimes we'll get an unrelated donor transplant up front. So it's hard to, hard to uh, be 100% sure about that. We have some data suggesting maybe a little bit better outcome. Uh, with unrelated donor on front, but we need to we need to test that. This is that data. Um, uh, looking at this slide on the right now, this is with a small number of patients. 29 patients transplanted at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London over several years up front with an unrelated donor transplant. And you can see very good survival, 90 uh, greater than 95 percent. Um, uh, with good outcomes. Now, what you don't see are rates of graft versus host disease or other complications. This is um, this red curve, pay attention to. This is a survival rate uh, for both pediatric and adult patients transplanted with the latest BMTCTN reduced intensity protocol. Um, uh, so these, these patients have failed immune suppression and they, they still have a good outcome. 
Um, uh, so there's no doubt that matched unrelated donor transplantation has really improved. Um, so the question then is, are sibling and unrelated donor outcomes equivalent? There's no doubt that sibling BMT is, the, is considered the best therapy because um, survival exceeds 95%. Chronic GVHD is really low, and rates of progression to MDS and AML is very low. This is important. The rates of cancer is 2 to 20%. But um, what it's important to understand is if you get immune suppression therapy alone, you may have MDS, AML occurring um, in... Uh, uh, as many as 15% of patients are treated with immune suppression therapy uh, alone. Now, um, here is a case to say that unrelated donor transplant equals sibling bone marrow transplant. Um, and that is that um, uh, you use a reduced intensity approach, second malignancies are lower, you may be able to preserve um, uh, uh, fertility in most patients, um, uh, if you give immune suppression alone, um, some patients will be at risk and they may not get to transplant. Um, so that's the argument for considering upfront uh, uh, therapy uh, with unrelated donor BMT in children. Now, um, the challenge with that is that um, what you're then doing is you're doing BMT on all the patients when half of them may have never needed a BMT. Um, and you're putting uh, your patient at risk for chronic GVHD. Um, and uh, when you have chronic GVHD, that's a big increase in late effect risk. In addition, if the BMT takes too long, then your patient may be at risk for failure. Um, so really, with these things in mind, we're not sure what the best upfront therapy is. And the standard of care really is um, uh, to not have upfront, upfront unrelated transplant. So let's talk briefly about L-Trombopag. Um, uh, one thing I want to make sure people understand is just because L-Trombopag has shown up, that doesn't mean that we've solved aplastic anemia. Um, there still are a number of patients who fail to respond to immune suppression therapy, and we need to get follow-up on the L-Trombopag uh, uh, results to say how long they last. Now, one interesting thing about the data in children with L-Trombopag, it may help them respond a little faster, but no one has done a comparative trial. The rates of children responding to immune suppression therapy were already high. The big difference in the adults with l pack is that a lot more of them had a complete response compared to uh, uh, others, and a higher percentage of patients um, uh, uh, had um, uh, uh, any response when l pack was used. But the data wasn't super different um, uh, in, in children. So l pack may make a, a difference in children, but if, if it's going to, it's going to be a relatively small difference. The big worry with l um, uh is that um, we're not sure still uh, the number of patients that are going to fail later on. Um, I communicated with the NIH group just the other day about this, and uh, Dr. Young mentioned very specifically that they're trying to have longer-term follow-up with l pack in the adult cohort um, out uh, for um, a meeting in the middle of next year. Um, so hopefully within the next six months or so, we'll have a little bit more data about uh, whether you get uh, uh, the failure a little bit later. Um, uh, but bottom line is we need, to, we need to get that data in before we know for sure. Um, but no matter what, a, a reasonable percentage of patients will still fail even with l pack. There's also a very strong concern about clonal evolution uh, uh, to MDS. Um, in some of the studies, uh, it seemed to come a little bit earlier, but we need more data on this to know. l pack is a relatively new uh, medicine. So here's the question. Should I or my child receive BMT as primary therapy for aplastic anemia? And when I say that, I mean unrelated donor BMT. My response to that is the current standard of care is immune suppression therapy using horse ATG, uh, either with or without l pack in pediatrics. You're going to have a great chance to respond. And then if you fail, you can have a, an unrelated donor transplant at that point. However, it, there's a study that is going on right now called the Transit Study, and it's a very good alternative. Um, if you want to go on a randomized trial to test this, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, but again, if patients fail, BMT outcomes are very 
good, and you need to get them to BMT fairly quickly so that they don't get a bad infection and lose the chance um, to have a, a BMT because they're not eligible, they're too sick. Now, what if patients don't have a matched unrelated donor? I recommend that they go on a study, and I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about those studies. Now, here's the first study I want to mention called TRANSIT, Transplantation Versus Immune Suppression Therapy, or the TRANSIT study. This is a joint effort between the North American Pediatric Aplastic Anemia Consortium and the Pediatric Blood Marrow Transplant Consortium. Um, it's currently open at 13 centers. Um, we've randomized 23 uh, patients, a 24th being randomized soon, hopefully, um, and the trial is proceeding very smoothly. We're applying for a phase three trial. We're hoping that, again, over the next five years, we'll be able to definitively say, all right, the best path is either immune suppression first and then go to transplant, or the best path is upfront transplant. We're going to have the data to say that with confidence, but it's going to take a number of years. Now, how about that failure? What if you don't have a completely matched unrelated donor? BMT-CTN-1502 um, is a great trial. It's open at 29 centers across the country for adults and children. Um, if your patient has, if, if the, the child um, has had immune suppression therapy and it's not responded after three months, um, uh, then, uh, uh, or there's another circumstance if your child responded to immune suppression and then later they failed, they are um, eligible to move forward if a matched unrelated donor is not readily available. And you can use a half-matched parent, sibling, or other relative uh, who's willing to donate. This is a reduced intensity regimen, um, and uh, the preliminary data is, is very nice. Uh, and it's presented right here, what you can see in 20 patients um, uh, transplanted uh, at Hodgkin's. Um, uh, 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 basically, um, uh, all but one of them um, uh, had complete engraftment. The second, uh, the, that one patient who had early graft failure was able to be salvaged. Um, uh, all, the patients are uh, all alive in this particular cohort and doing well. Um, so it's a promising uh, approach, and we're hoping to prove that on the with this national study. So finally, I want to spend just a few minutes going through what you can do during BMT to help, and then afterwards uh, to maximize your health. And I'll go through these principles pretty quickly so we can have some time for questions at the end. So two big keys to success before and after transplant. Um, key number one is infection is your enemy. Take it very seriously. Um, you'll get some advice from your caregivers about keeping your child's environment clean. You don't need to be crazy about it, but you, you do need to keep them in a clean environment. Take preventive antibiotics and antifungals. Um, beware about exposures to people who are sick. Um, but most important of all, be seen by your physician immediately with signs of infection. Don't wait. The second thing is don't miss meds or doctor visits. Um, you will look at your child and they will look fine, they'll look normal, but they're not. They don't have a good and well-functioning immune system. Um, missing cyclosporine or preventive meds decreases their chance to respond and it increases their infection. Missing appointments mean your doctors can't follow levels and screen for problems and you're, you know, you're asking for trouble. So those are the keys to success. So nutrition, let's talk about that briefly. Um, does nutrition matter? The short answer to that is yes. Um, uh, but it cannot be a substitution for immune suppression or BMT. So if anyone comes to you and says, I have a bunch of nutritional supplements that are going to fix your aplastic anemia, they're wrong. So please don't believe them. Um, uh, you, you should, uh, it can, good nutrition should be um, uh, used with um, the proper therapies. Um, and the nutrition that I always recommend is healthy, balanced meals, high in fiber, fruits, and vegetables, avoid excessive sugar and carbohydrates, Eat a good, healthy diet. Um, what about supplements? I would be very aware of anything that calls itself an immune-enhancing supplement or tells you that it's going to help um, uh, immune diseases because they're not tested, they're not purified, and they could make things worse. I recommend that for supplements you work with your physician. Some aplastic anemia is caused by supplements. In other words, there are, there are supplements that can damage the marrow, um, so I'd be careful about that. Vitamins in recommended doses um, are reasonable. Megadose vitamins have not been shown um, to help. Um, how about your BMT approach? The big key is you work with your doctors to understand your preparative regimen and marrow source. And I've talked to you about a lot of things 
uh, about specific approaches. I want to say one thing. Standard bone marrow is the cell source of choice. Um, so if your doctor is going to use PBFC or cord blood, make sure you understand why they're recommending that and, and ask them why they're not using standard bone marrow. Sometimes you have no other choice, um, uh, but uh, that's incredibly important. And finally, if your child has an infection at BMT, you may have to move forward, but realize that puts them at higher risk. If it's all possible, it's nice to have the infections under control. Now, how about during the transplant procedure? What can you do? I always say limit exposure, make sure that your child is you're doing everything you can while the transplant going on to avoid infections. If you are ill yourself, have a backup, get yourself better, um, uh, stay home for a little while. Um, uh, and uh, when you're well and you're not going to uh, transmit that infection to your child, then head on back, but have, have a backup. Mobilize your family resources. Um, to have a lot of people there to help you, uh, or at least a key number of family people uh, uh, members there to help you. Everyone needs a break. Um, other things to mention are get your child out of bed, have them eat if they can. Um, that's going to help them be better faster. The final thing, and this is just a practical thing, be positive and inquisitive. Work with your BMT team. Um, if, if you're positive and a good and a good member working together with them, uh, you're going to get better care and have better outcomes. Now, after the BMT, what, what do you do? Those two keys to success don't change. You want to respond to infection and never miss a medication uh, or a clinic visit. I'm going to add a couple more things. Don't forget, a sun exposure um, is bad. It can cause graft-versus-host disease. And be careful about infection risks and tell your doctor, say it's okay to go ahead and be exposed to the real world. Um, immunizations are one clue. When you get to the point where you're uh, getting re-immunized, uh, you know that uh, uh, your doctor has enough confidence uh, that you may be able to be exposed to uh, uh, more things. Uh, how about returning to school? Um, uh, infection risks vary by center. Uh, uh, excuse me, approach, your approach varies by center, so work with your physicians. Um, uh, it's going to depend on the type of BMT you have and the risk that you have um, uh, at the given time. If you have a lot of treatment because you've got GVHD, your risk in, is going to be higher as opposed to those that are off immune suppressive therapy. Um, uh, I, uh, same thing uh, that I just mentioned as far as returning school to school, talk to your uh, center. Now, I don't have a lot of time left, so I want to just mention the most important thing here, and that is there are some light effects that occur um, uh, and all of them uh, uh, add up uh, to uh, health-related quality of life. Um, but they're multifactorial. Um, it's not just your transplant. Um, it's the genetics associated with what you're being transplanted for, um, and so you need a global assessment. Um, there are a number of uh, resources out there, and so you can look through uh, my uh, presentation, and you're going to see um, uh, uh, these couple of key resources that are going to talk to you about late effects. There was a late effects um, conference uh, in 2016 that specifically talked about marrow failure disorders. Um, so there's some resources there that can help you understand the late effects that you need to watch for. But the most important thing is to visit a late effects program. Um, there, you, you want to have you want experts who, who know exactly uh, what to look for um, uh, following your child um, long term uh, so that they can be screened um, for growth and development and psychosocial issues. Um, now, there are a lot of different things they're going to look at. They're going to look for second cancers. They're going to look at hormone balance, lung and heart health. Um, and so you, you just need to watch very carefully for these issues. Um, some patients after transplanted, this is usually after the more intense regimens, they have problems with just simple things like high triglycerides uh, that you can easily treat with diet or with medicines, and that's going to help their heart long term. How about your child's brain? Very unlikely that the type of transplants that are going to be used are going to help or are going to affect your child's brain um, long term, which is which is encouraging. Um, so, is is BMT going to affect that? Well, um, the most important thing to do is to try to avoid chronic GVHD if possible. That's going to affect your child's quality of life early uh, as, as much as you can. Um, in aplastic anemia with immune suppression therapy, um, uh, comparing immune suppression versus transplant, 
realize that there are long-term effects of immune suppression therapy as well, and you need to watch for those. Long-term issues with immune suppression therapy um, include following for MDS um, uh, and AML or, or making sure that long-term kidney issues with cyclosporine don't occur. Um, uh, so that's a, a very important thing to keep track of. Um, I talked a little bit about tr uh, BMT patients um, who, who get BMT for aplastic anemia. Uh, uh, the key thing to keep in mind is their late effects, if they have them, with these minimally intense regimens are, are, are pretty minimal and very similar to any late effects they'd have with immune suppression therapy, which is, which is good. Now, I have a few um, uh, uh, ways to quantitate that. You can look through these slides, but we're getting close to the end. I think the big message here is growth appears to be normal and quality of life um, appears to be normal. The chance of fertility is good um, after re uh, reduced intensity transplantation for aplastic anemia. Um, and in general, in this particular study of adult survivors, um, uh, quality of life in patients who had transplantation or aplastic anemia was uh, was very similar to controls with their siblings. So it, it, it uh, fortunately the quality of life long term if you don't get chronic GVHD um, is is quite good. So in summary, um, uh, your outcomes are going to depend on your underlying disease and your treatment um, and uh, complications that can occur. Um, but the most important issue to optimize outcomes are making sure your child has the right diagnosis understanding when BMT is appropriate, working with your physicians to use the least toxic approach, um, doing the two keys that I've mentioned twice before and want to just have you read again, uh, and then following up yearly with expert and late effects to screen for treatable medical issues. Um, so that's the uh, end of my program, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pulsifer, for the wonderful presentation. We have a few questions. Uh, first off, um, for this parent, it um, looks like there's a possibility that the transplant is failing. Is um, transplant another option, and um, are they should they be looking to use the same donor, or would it be more beneficial to try to find another donor? The donor they use is a related um, match donor. Yes. So this is a very challenging question, um, and uh, here's the important take-home message. In rare cases, less than 5%, but it definitely happens, patients can have what we call graft failure. When that happens, they need a second transplant. Um, whether they use the same donor or a different donor um, is something that uh, is very much an individual situation. Do they have another unrelated donor that's a great match potentially available? Um, do they, uh, 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 you know, why did they have uh, the rejection? Was it due to an infection that's now controlled? Um, many times with a related donor, you can do a rescue procedure using that related donor's marrow and be very successful. And that's usually the easiest and best way to go. I couldn't give specifics about the very best donor, but I, I do say, uh, uh, will say that um, once they've determined that they truly have a rejection um, or, or, and marrow failure after a uh, transplant, moving on to that second transplant very quickly is important uh, because uh, that maximizes the chances of success. Great, thank you. Our next question is um, this family their child um, has undergone two rounds of ATG, and now they're looking to go to um, transplant with their related sibling donor. Their question is, um, does having the two rounds before transplant um, potentially lessen the success of the transplant? Uh, well, that is something we don't have enough data to say. Um, there are two things that increase risk of uh, uh, not doing well with transplant, and that is having lots of transfusions. Uh, so if during that period of time when they were doing the two rounds of, of ATG, the patient underwent lots of transfusions, that may make it a little more likely that they'll have rejection. The second issue is infection 
and organ damage that are caused that, that could be caused by infection. If the patient has a recent infection or ongoing infection or has had organ damage from infection, then that increases the risk um, of failure. All of that said, um, it's the right thing to do if they have that related donor to move forward with transplant um, and they have a very good chance of success. Um, remember I mentioned that with a sibling transplant, um, success is in the 95 plus percent range, even if there is a somewhat decreased chance of success um, because of having had some more transfusions, there still is a great overall chance of success with, their, um, with moving forward with a related donor transplant at this point. Great. Thank you. Um, we talked about the success stats for um, apostic anemia transplants. Do you have any information on MDS and uh, MUD transplants? Any stats for, the, for that? Yes. Um, so right now in uh, pediatrics, the outcome of um, at, uh, unrelated donor transplant and sibling transplant for MDS is essentially identical. So I'll just talk about that. For patients who are treated very early with what we call refractory anemia and they haven't had excessive transfusions, there's good chance of survival that uh, in small series uh, is in the 75 to 80 percent range. The challenge is that uh, if uh, MDS becomes more advanced and goes on to what we call RAEB or refractory anemia with excess blasts, or if um, uh, uh, you go on even further with an older classification system called in transition where you have blasts in the you know close to the 20% range then the likelihood of relapse uh goes up very significantly um so that's where chances of both match sibling or unrelated donor goes down and maybe in the in the 40% range um there still is a chance of cure um, but it's just lower because of the, the chance of relapse. So the take-home message for this is, um, in general, if, if you're lucky enough to find a diagnosis of, uh, in a child of uh, MDS and it's early stage um, and you've got a good donor, I recommend moving ahead early in order to maximize chance of cure rather than waiting for potential progression to late-stage MDS. Thank you. And... Um the other question is, what about for um, haploid identical transplants and MDS? I think you're in the same situation. Now, um, haploid identical transplantation for MDS is a little tricky. The reason for that is that um, we know that in almost any uh, other test that we've tested with, uh, in the last three to five years, this is just the last three to five years when alpha, beta, uh, and post-transplant cyclophosphamide, these two techniques for haploidental transplantation have been developed. Um, if you look at uh, outcomes for ALL, outcomes for AML, et cetera, it appears that the haploidental outcomes are very similar to the outcomes um, with uh, either unrelated donor, uh, with, with unrelated donors. Um, but we really need head-to-head -head comparisons, and, and studies are being planned to, to show that. All the preliminary data suggests that the outcomes are similar, um, and it, so, so you can move forward with that haploidentical transplant. But here's the trick. With MDS, there may be an increased chance of rejection. So what um, your transplant physician will need to do is be very considerate of that and make sure they're doing everything they can to maximize the chance uh, of avoiding rejection. And that means using a good cell dose, using the right preparative regimen. Um, doing those things, hopefully, um, the uh, outcomes with MDS will be equally uh, as good as the outcomes with the other diseases. Um, but that's the key with HAPLO for MDS is work very hard to avoid rejection. Sometimes it's the only alternative a patient has, and in that case, it's very reasonable to, to move forward with it. Great. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Pulsifer, for, for the wonderful presentation and your time. I'd also like to add that if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for the email that will provide you with the archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and making us your resource of choice on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to get to your question today, please send us an email at help at aamds.org so we can respond and get the answers to your questions. As a reminder, when I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will pop up on the screen. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey. Your responses do help us and make sure that we're meeting your needs. Again, thank you for joining us today. Remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.